Um, okay, go ahead. Dr. Simon earned his PhD in 2010 with Dr. Barry Setlow at Texas A&M University, where his research focused on the relationship between risk-taking and substance use vulnerability in preclinical models. His, we worked as um, a postdoctoral researcher and a research professor at the University of Pittsburgh from 2010 to 2016 with Dr. Beta Moghabadan, assessing the role of prefrontal cortex and motivating behaviors across the lifespan. He is now assistant professor with the University of Memphis Department of Psychology, where his lab investigates the neuropsychological, pharmacological, pharmacological and genetic factors underlying cost benefit with decision making. His research on risk taking behavior and addiction is supported by the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Uh, Dr. Simon, we're very pleased to have you join us uh, from uh, Memphis. Uh, thank you so much. All right, uh, great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, please let me know if at any point you need me to uh, stop for questions. I don't wanna end, us, end up with us uh, too far behind schedule. And uh, if I'm too loud or quiet, let me know. I'm happy to yell or back up. Um, I apologize if I look kind of like the grim specter of death with this dark shadow over me, but mm -hmm. um, Memphis is basically shut down right now. So my, my normal Zoom suite is in my office. So you're getting me in the, in the back room. <laughs> you look great so, and thank you for braving the weather. Yeah, well, I'm not braving the so weather. It's I'm about saying. 75 degrees in Los Angeles and perfectly sunny today. Oh, well, fair enough. That's, yeah. uh, that's, that's so delightful to hear. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I never thought I'd be coming to you from snowy Memphis, but here we are. And that's what it's come to. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about um, risky decision making and different genetic approaches to studying it. And uh, this talk, I'm going to talk about several topics. And um, for each one of these, I'm going to talk about both a technique that we use in the lab and how we apply that technique to address a very specific research question. So I'm going to try to cover both techniques and um, application. Um, if at any point it, I'm going too far, let me know. I can cut this short if you for number four, but we'll see. We'll get the, uh, see how fast I can talk. All right, so, so I'm gonna start out by talking about risky decision-making. Why do we care about it? How do we measure it in a rat model? You've probably learned a lot about animal models and why they're useful and the amount of behavioral control we have and control over experience, the, the biological manipulations we can do. And we've also learned that rats are a lot like humans in terms of their sensitivity to uh, substance use. And there are different approaches to studying addiction in these animal models. And a lot of what you're probably going to learn about in these sessions is uh, measures of testing drug sensitivity and drug relapse, things like drug self-administration, alcohol drinking. They usually don't drink out of such a delightful glass, but... Um, this rat is getting the special, getting the good stuff. Um, that's one approach to studying addiction, but the approach that I take on is instead of studying drug taking itself, I'm really interested in understanding the behaviors that can kind of cause vulnerability to substance use. Things like impulsivity and um, hyper motivation and sensitivity to like predictive cues. And one thing in particular that I'm gonna talk about today is risk-taking, risky decision-making. And what that is, is that it, risky decision-making is anytime you make a decision that is influenced by the possibility of negative consequences. Usually you're choosing between two different rewarding options, but one of them might have something negative associated with it. And risky decision-making, this is something we do every day, sometimes on a small scale, sometimes on a large scale. But if you're driving and you come up on a yellow light. You need to make the decision. Do you want to keep driving and maybe get to work a little earlier and, and uh, make better time? Or do you wanna, but also, uh, but also risk getting an accident, getting a ticket? Or do you want to stop and be sort of safe, be risk averse? And we face these small decisions every day and Risk taking can be a good thing. I don't want to come up here and say, don't take risks, don't do it, because that'd be silly. You're all here because you took risks, whether it's grad school or med school or just trying to learn more about substance use. And that's a beneficial risk to take. So risk taking is a great thing. We've evolved to the point where we take risks and it benefits us often greatly, but 
ongoing pathological risk taking can be a really negative thing. It can be maladaptive, particularly in disorders like drug use, um, ADHD, and other disorders where people kind of compulsively take risks and really disregard the possibility of consequences. This is particularly important for drug use, for substance use. And uh, as you know, substance use disorder is characterized by ongoing drug seeking despite consequences, physical consequences, money consequences, social consequences. If you continue to use these drugs, there are gonna be some sort of consequences so really every time someone decides to seek out or use drugs, they're making, they're faced with this risky decision. Do you want to do the safe choice and abstain from the drug? Or do you want to do the riskier choice, which is much, much more rewarding and that is use the drug. But there's a risk of withdrawal. There's a risk of addiction. There's a risk of being arrested for illegal activity. So in the end, risk-taking Happened is something that happens again and again in substance users. And my lab's research aims to understand what happens in our brain when we make a decision. What is the difference between somebody who just keeps taking risks and somebody who's a little more balanced and safe with their decision making? What is going on in their brain that causes these difference, differences? And the long-term goal is to be able to take people who have these issues with substance use, continue to show risky behavior and develop treatments and ways to identify people who are at risk before they start using different drugs. So how do we measure risk-taking in rats? Risk-taking is fairly easy to measure in people. You throw them in a casino and see how they do. You know, in this lovely casino with all the shining lights, free drinks, all these things, easy to measure. Well, in rats, you can't really let them loose in a casino, but we can make our own little rat casino it's not as exciting, but you, know, you can add a fountain, give a nice little sign. And uh, we use these to measure risky behavior and decision-making that um, involves ongoing risk-taking. So let me explain quickly how we measure this in rats. And this is impressive because this kind of shows how smart rats can be because they can detect all these different things and make decisions rationally. So we have a little rat in a chamber and they are faced with two levers. If they pick one of them, they just get a single food pellet and that's it. Pretty nice, right? They love food pellets of sugar. They're delicious for them. Objectively great option. If they choose the other one, they get three food pellets by itself. That's better every time. A smart rat is gonna pick that every single time. However, the three food pellets is accompanied by a risk of a really quick, relatively mild foot shot. So the rat needs to decide, do I want this small reward or do I want a bigger reward that's much better, but I might get shot. So rats are able to decide, do, do you want to risk punishment or do you want to just take the safe route? And we uh, titrate this throughout the session. It starts out with 0% chance of punishment goes up to 25, 50, 75, and then 100. And we tested, do rats prefer risky or safe options? Can they detect changes? Can rats tell probabilities? That sounds crazy, right? Well, they kind of can. Um, this was published in NeuroPsycho Farm. It's got a beautiful picture of a rat playing, seems like rolling, playing craps maybe, but he's also a dealer. I don't know. But um, this figure here on the left, uh, let me orient you really quickly. The y-axis is the amount of times they choose the risky reward. The higher the number, the more risk take. Then the x-axis right here is what is the risk. It starts out 0%, 25, 50. I hope you can see my mouse here because I'm using it. Um, as you can see, rats show this shift in decision-making where initially they pick the large reward when there's no risk. As it gets riskier, they move away from it. They start to go safer and safer as the risk increases. This is something we do too. Humans will make decisions that are informed by how risky they are. And usually a normal person will take small risks, but as the risks get bigger and greater, they'll shift away from that strategy. So that's cool. Rats can detect probabilities. Well done, rats. But uh, one of the interesting things about this task is every time you run it, you get this substantial amount 
of individual variability. And look at this, you can see this here on the right. You have some rats who will just pick the risky option every time. They just can't stay away from it. They just keep taking risks. Whereas we have other rats who as soon as there's risk, they pretty much start avoiding it almost completely. So you have this massive variability and this fits with the human population. Even though rats are bred to be pretty similar and rats are all exposed to the same environment, they all eat the same food, they don't have differences in socioeconomic status, but we still see these substantial individual differences in risk taking. These are all from different experiments from different labs. And each one of these shows individual differences. Uh, some rats are just like, give me that risk, it's worth it. I don't care if I get shot. And then you have some rats who are just like, no, I will never choose it. Even when it's safe, I'm not gonna choose it because I know there's a, foot, a shot that's associated with that choice. And I am really interested in understanding this variability. What is the difference between these rats up on top and these rats on the bottom? Hello, your dog, Hello. hi dog. Um, and uh, we found that for, before I go on, this risk taking is really stable across the lifespan. It's not just some state dependent phenomenon. Rats who are risky stay risky for just about their entire life. Um, we've shown that it's unrelated to pain tolerance. Rats don't just pick the shock because they're not sensitive to it. That doesn't matter. There just seems to be this natural individual variability in risk taking. And I'm really interested in studying this. And one of the cool things that me and my lab have found, um, Daniel Gabriel and Anna Liley in my lab have uh, found a lot of this, is that these rats that are really risky show all these other traits that are seen in substance use disorder. They're impulsive, which means when they make a choice and then that choice no longer becomes viable, they'll continue to choose it. They continue to go back to a previously rewarded response. That's impulsivity. Um, they're really sensitive to cues in the environment. This is what you see in substance users. When they walk by a bar or they walk by a bathroom that they usually use drugs in, they get this craving because cues have a lot of control over behavior. We found that risk takers are sensitive to cues. Um, they also love drugs. Uh, risk takers are really sensitive to cocaine. A rat who's risky will take cocaine and learn to take cocaine more quickly. And they're also more sensitive to nicotine. The first time they get nicotine, they're very sensitive to it, which predicts future addiction. So this shows that these rats who are risky, just by measuring behavior in this one task, you can kind of identify this cluster of addiction-relevant traits. And so I'm really interested in what is going on biologically that makes these rats at risk. It's just like humans, right? Only 10% of people who use drugs will go on to develop substance use disorder what is different about those people that makes them vulnerable? And I'm trying to study this in rats. What's different about certain rats that makes them vulnerable? And how can we intervene to make them less vulnerable? Well, it's sort of cut off, but the bottom line is the genetics underlying risky decision-making are of great interest to myself and my lab. And let's talk about them a little bit. So first I'm gonna talk about the relationship between risky decision-making and dopamine receptor gene expression. You just heard Dr. Evans talk a little about dopamine. There's a lot to say about it, so I'm not going to get into too much detail on the function of dopamine. It's complicated. It's not just feel-good neurotransmitter. There's a lot more than that. So to orient you, we found that there's a certain type of receptor called the D2 dopamine receptor that regulates decision-making. If you take rats and you give them amphetamine, you give them speed, that changes their risk taking. They actually become less risky, which when that happened, I was a little surprised, but it makes sense because stimulant drugs tend to make people and animals really sensitive to negative consequences. So we learned that amphetamine affects risk taking. And then if you break this down and look at all the different receptors that amphetamine affects, the D2 receptors, D2 dopamine receptors seem to be the ones that are specifically involved. So it seems like something about D2 receptors controls our decision-making process. And we did a lot more experiments. We, uh, not only did we activate D2 receptors, but we gave rats amphetamine and then blocked D2 receptors and amphetamine no longer did anything. So D2 receptors specifically seem to be important. The problem with this is D2 receptors are scattered everywhere in our brain. 
just saying D2 receptors matter is really simplifying this issue because you can't just give a person a D2 drug. Well, you can, but you know, in some cases it'd be an antipsychotic if it was a D2 agonist. You can't just completely affect D2 throughout the brain because it'll have massive effects. And D2 receptors, as you can see by this uh, uh, figure here made by uh, Yasmin Hurt, th that D2 and D1 receptors are scattered all throughout the brain. So I wanted to know which of these areas are the ones that matter. We know that D2 receptors play some role in risk taking. I wanted to know, all right, where? Where is the location of D2 receptors effects? And that way we can maybe determine, all right, well, if we manipulate D2 receptors in this area, we might be able to help people with decision-making problems. Well, how do we do this? I use a technique called in situ hybridization. A real quick biology lesson that I'm sure most of you probably know very well, but I'm gonna say it anyway, is that we have this genetic material called DNA in our cells and that DNA is transcribed into mRNA and mRNA is what is used to actually create proteins through translation. So DNA contains the recipe for proteins, DNA creates mRNA, and then that creates proteins. So every time our brain says we need more dopamine receptors, it'll go through this process where DNA creates mRNA, creates proteins. I was interested in figuring out how much mRNA for the D2 receptor is in different brain areas. This is a really great way to determine like how many of receptors a person has at one given time and how many receptors is a person producing at one given time because we're constantly producing new proteins. The technique in situ hybridization, the way this works is you take a brain slice and I'm trying to find all the D2 receptor mRNA. So what I do is you put this special probe of antisense mRNA. Basically, it's an mRNA that matches up with D2 receptors. And every time it finds D2 receptors, it will bind to it and form this double helix like DNA. And then what we do, you can see this little spider here. That's because we go into the spider verse to solve this problem. And we actually use a radioactive tag and we put that on the strand of mRNA. That way, every time there's D2 at receptor mRNA, you're going to have this little bit of radioactivity that shows up. So you're able to use this radioactivity to measure how much mRNA there is in the brain. So this is called in situ hybridization. It's a way of measuring mRNA. It doesn't measure genes itself, but it measures the output of genes. It measures what are genes creating. And this is really important because um, the proteins created by our genes are one of the things that determines how vulnerable we might be to substance use. So we used in situ hybridization to label D2 mRNA. And one of the benefits of this is you can look at it all throughout the brain. You're not just taking the brain and mashing it up into one little ball and saying, well, there's more D2 in these risk takers. No, you can look at it in very specific areas like prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex. Uh, this is a really nice example from Shelley Flagel's lab that shows it in uh, the part of, a part of the thalamus. And you can look at the brain in specific areas to determine, all right, well, in a risk taker, do we see differences in D2 in specific brain regions compared to risk averse rats? So this is what we did. And cool, we found some stuff. We actually found that risk takers, remember these rats up here who just love taking risks and keep choosing risky options, they actually have less D2 receptor expression in an area called the dorsal striatum. Dorsal striatum is involved with a lot of different types of behavior. Classically, it's more associated with things like movement and learning, but more recently, it's been associated with substance use vulnerability and reward. And we found that risk takers actually have less D2 in their dorsal striatum. And this is cool by itself, but when you think about human substance users, this becomes really cool because there's a very famous finding showing that people who have been using cocaine for years have less D2 receptors in their dorsal striatum. So it's like, holy crap, these rats who have never used drugs in their life, they, oh, they're just, they happen to be risky. Their brains look like the brains of people who have used substances. 
So this is another reason why using measuring risk taking is a really useful model of substance use because risk taking rats have a brain profile that res resembles people who are vulnerable to drug use. So we use in situ a hybridization found reduced D2 receptors expression in the dorsal striatum. We also found increased D1 receptor expression in an area called the nucleus accumbens shell. This is an area more classically associated with reward and substance use. And this could mean a lot of things. One possibility is, is uh, because D1 receptors are um, excitatory receptors, um, the fact that there are more receptors may mean that there's more dopamine being released in this area and the receptors are being upregulated to account for that. Or the fact that there's more receptors might mean that there's less dopamine release. So I wanted to measure this. It's like, okay, well, we know that if you look at a slice, you see these differences in receptors. But what actually, what are the differences in functional dopamine measures? And we did this in collaboration with uh, Duranda Lester at the University of Memphis. She uses a real cool technique called fixed potential amperometry. And I'm not going to go into detail here, but what this is, is it's a way of electrically measuring dopamine release. Every time dopamine is released in the synapse, if you apply this very small current, it will cause that dopamine to oxidize. And when that happens, you have this very specific electrical signature that you can measure. So you can use this technique to measure how much dopamine is released during normal events. And so we took a new group of rats, characterized them in risk-taking. The red rats are the ones who are a little more risky. The black are the ones who are a little more risk-averse. And we found that risk takers have just this hyperactive dopamine groups. Every time you stimulate their dopamine midbrain, you have this massive, it's called phasic dopamine release in their nucleus accumbens compared to risk averse rats. And this is really interesting because um, phasic dopamine release is something that happens when, you're, when you see drug predictive cues and it's something that kind of drives motivation and drives behavior. So it seems like these risk takers have an issue where they have this hypersensitive dopamine system in reward related areas, which probably explains why they keep taking these risks and making, I guess, essentially bad maladaptive decisions. So in summary of this section, risk takers as characterized by our task, they show changes in dopamine receptor gene expression. These changes are associated with uh, dopamine measures in the, in the, in the intact rats, and this may explain why these rats are willing to take risks during a reward seeking. So this is kind of cool. Now we know that rats that are risky have very specific differences in dopamine that may be driving that risk taking. So the next step is going to be to manipulate this to see if we can change it and make a risky rat safe or make a safe rat risky. Well, let me go on to the next topic. We're going to switch gears a little bit because uh, I want to focus on genetics and I'm going to talk about a thing called optogenetics. We're about to get real fancy and technical up in here. And, and by that, I mean, we're going to manipulate the brain with lasers, which, hey, that's cool, right? Um, optogenetics is a way of manipulating brain activity in an awake behaving animal using lights, either lasers or fiber optics. Optogenetics is this term, that broad term that kind of applies to the whole uh, technique of both adapting rats so they're sensitive to light and manipulating light. This was developed by a lot of different people. Carl Dyseroff at Stanford is sort of the, the godfather of this and, and it's become a pretty common technique used for brain manipulation. So let's discuss. How does it work? Well, it's really an ingenious technique and what it does is it uses algae to help us manipulate the brain. Algae, how, how does that work? Well, Algae don't have a lot going on. They don't have a lot of receptors and things like that. They're pretty simple. Really, what they need to do is algae need to respond to light. So they have these light-sensitive receptors. One of them is called channel rhodopsin. And that channel rhodopsin is activated by light. And that's what kind of enables them to move toward light and migrate toward areas where there's light so they can do photosynthesis. And this is something that we don't have in the inside of our brain. I mean, in optic regions, yes, but like inside our brain, we don't really have light sensitive channels. So people came up with this idea to take this channel 
and come up with a way to put it into the rat brain and integrate it into their DNA. And the way they did that is with viruses. Viruses are so hot these days, right? Viruses are everywhere. Well, viruses have been hot neuroscience for a while. And uh, what happens is they actually take the DNA for channel rhodopsin and put it into a virus and then insert that virus directly into an animal. And this virus, it's not infectious. It doesn't cause sickness or illness, but what it does do is it causes their neurons to express this receptor. All of a sudden these neurons that usually don't have light receptors start to develop them and are able to communicate through light receptors. So also, and these light receptors by themselves don't do anything because there's no light in the brain. You're changing the rat's brain, but you're really not changing anything about them. Their behavior is the same generally, and uh, there's not just random light flashes inside their head, so these receptors aren't affecting activity. Um, what you can do, though, is stick this teeny tiny fiber optic cable into a very specific area of the brain where these receptors are and shine a little light in there, just for one millisecond. And when you shine that light, that causes these receptors to be activated. And there are different types of receptors. Channel rhodopsin causes positive ions to enter the cell, which means it increases activity. Uh, there's also a channel called halo rhodopsin, and it's a chloride pump that reduces activity. It's basically a way you can, by shining a light, you can just turn off one brain area just for a moment and then turn it back on. This is really cool because this allows this precise control of brain activity in very specific areas. And the advantages of this are, first of all, this is biologically relevant. If the, before this, if you wanted to stimulate the brain, you'd have to put an electrode in there and pass a current through it, which can work, but that's not really, it's usually much, much more potent than biological, physiological activity. Whereas with optogenetics, you're just opening a channel, which is something that happens all the time in neurons. It's, it's pretty normal ion transmission. Um, also with optogenetics, you can control specific populations of neurons. You can use certain mutant mice and rats so that you only stimulate dopamine neurons or acetylcholine neurons or neurons that project from one area to another. So optogenetics can be very precise in terms of what neurons you target. Um, also, it can be very temporally precise. And by that, I mean, it can, you can manipulate it at certain times. You can turn it off and on very, very quickly. Let me explain, let me show you an example of why that affects things. And um, our lab hasn't done any optogenetics work with risky decision-making yet, but I'm gonna present some data from my colleague, uh, Caitlin Orsini, who has done some really great work looking at an area called the basal lateral amygdala. You've probably heard of the amygdala. It's usually associated with threat and fear, but it's a lot more complicated than that. It's also involved with reward and decision-making. It has a lot of different functions in terms of reinforcement. So here's just our schematic of the task right here. Remember, rats choose between a large risky reward and a small safe reward. The old school approach to manipulating the brain um, might be um, a thing called lesions. A lesion is when you either electrically or chemically destroy one small area of the brain. Everything else is intact, but just that one area of the brain is knocked out. And that way you can determine, does this part of the brain play some role in behavior? And what Orsini, Dr. Orsini did is that she destroyed the basolateral amygdala during risky decision-making. And she found that it actually increases risk taking. If you knock the amygdala out, the specific part of it, rats that were sort of risky get really risky. You can see this black line here is rats who don't have a basolateral amygdala. They pick that risky reward more. So it's like, okay, well, this is cool. The basolateral amygdala clearly plays some role in risky decision-making, but the problem with this is that the amygdala is shut down throughout the entire task. It's completely shut down. And decision-making is not this kind of uh, merged together process. Decision-making is actually really complicated. It consists of several steps. When you shut down a brain area, you're just completely affecting the entire task, every part of it. With optogenetics, 
you can be much more specific. So one thing Dr. Orsini did was she used optogenetics to shut down the amygdala only right before they made a decision. So instead of it being shut down the whole time throughout the entire task, right before they made a choice, she shined in this laser, which activated a thing called halo rhodopsin, which slows down those neurons. And this is pretty cool. She found the opposite effects. Before, if you shut down basal lateral amygdala, it makes them more risky. But if you only do it at this precise time point, it actually makes animals less risky. Then after that, she tried other time points. One spot she did was right after they received the outcome. After they made a risky choice and they got the reward and possibly a shock, then she shined the laser and shut down the basal lateral amygdala. And she found the opposite. She found that when you do it here, it actually makes them more risky. So this is really cool. And this shows that basal lateral amygdala is involved with risk taking, but its role is actually really complicated. And a lot of the old experimental approaches where we just shut down a brain region completely don't really reveal this. So optogenetics, one of the uses is that you can shut down at very specific time points to determine, all right, well, what happens if we manipulate activity right before a decision or right after a decision or after an outcome? And this is really important for treatments. If we want to develop treatments for substance use and for people who keep making bad decisions, you don't wanna just shut down the amygdala for 10 minutes. You wanna be able to shut it down at the specific time to maybe change their decision-making without causing massive changes in their motivation and emotion. So after genetic manipulation showed that risky decision-making is really complicated and it showed that the, the amygdala is involved with it, but it's involved in this nuanced way where if you shut down the amygdala right before they make a choice, all of a sudden they're less risky. But if you shut it down after they've made a choice, that affects the next trial and makes them more risky. So we're really excited to do more follow-up work on this and look at, okay, we know that shutting down the amygdala by itself does this. What happens if we shut down certain cell types of the amygdala? What happens if we shut down basal lateral amygdala neurons that project to the orbital frontal cortex or the nucleus accumbens or somewhere else? So optogenetics is really useful because it allows a level of precision that we've never really had before. And now we're able to, it's become pretty commonplace in addiction research. Dr. Simon, maybe in two or three more minutes or so. Okay, well, I have a final section and I think we'll just kind of rush through it then, um, no problem. Um, finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about using a behavioral genetics approach. So I talked about looking at gene expression. I talked about manipulating genetics to manipulate activity. Now I'm gonna talk about, all right, this is all cool, but how do we find out what genes make rats risky? And behavioral genetics is the investigation of what genes are involved with different traits? If you've done 23andMe, it'll tell you, hey, you have this gene, that means you might have issues with cholesterol or this, that. Well, what I wanna know is can we say, well, you have this gene on your 13th chromosome, that means you might be, have issues with risk-taking, so be very mindful of this. And you know, maybe someone shouldn't give you tons of opioid painkillers because you have a propensity for risk-taking. Um, this is tough to do in humans for various reasons. Um, for humans, when you measure behavior, it's influenced by so many other factors, things like peer pressure and financial situations um, and race relations. There's so many factors right now that influence people's decision-making. So you can't really say these decisions are related to genetics in a person because there's just so much going on. Also, humans are so diverse genetically. That's very difficult to do studies. You really need just a bunch of twins to do these studies. And we got some twins, but we don't have as many as we need to test things like risk taking. So how do we do this in an animal model? And I'm pretty, getting pretty close to the end here, so bear with me for another couple minutes. Well, one possibility is take two inbred rat strains, Lewis, stra Lewis and Fisher. These are both rats that are completely inbred and had been for decades. They're basically twins. Every Lewis rat is a twin with every other Lewis rat. They're so inbred that they're genetically almost identical. So we thought, well, what if we compare two of these strains? Basically, it's like comparing one set of twins with another set of twins. And sorry, it doesn't work. These two different strains are too different. If you looked at behaviors, 
you'd be like, okay, how do we compare them to genetics? You can't because there are tens and tens of thousands of genetic variants. There's so many differences in genetics. So we need two strains that are more similar without being identical. And the way we did this is we took this Lewis strain of rats, which is was bred way back in the, you know, uh, I don't know, I think around the 50s, maybe. I might be wrong, but something like that. And these rats are bred at different breeders. They started out at one breeder and then they were moved to another breeder. So we have these two different colonies of genetically similar rats. And these are from a place called Charles River and a place called Invigo. These are two different breeders and they both breed Lewis's. So we use these two different strains and these two strains, instead of having tens of, of, of thousands of differences, they only have like hundreds of genetic differences. They're very similar. It's like comparing, again, twins with each other and we need minimal genetic variants to be able to look at behavioral genetics. So what we did was we took these two strains Charles River and Vigo, Lewis's, almost exactly the same genetically, and we ran them in risk taking. And what do you know? We got lucky. There's a big difference. Charles River Lewis's are much riskier than in Vigo Lewis's. This is awesome. Now that we have this preliminary data, we're really excited to go to the next step. And that is called quantitative trait locus analysis or QTL analysis. Very briefly, a couple more slides left. Um, what you do is you take these two different strains and you breed them with each other. You do what's called a reduced complexity cross. So you take one strain, the other strain, you breed them together, and then you take the offspring and you breed them together. So you're doing this double cross. And what this does is this minimizes genetic variability. All of a sudden you have these two, these final strains of rats that are so genetically similar that if you see a behavioral difference, you can figure out exactly what genes are causing that difference. The name of the game here is reducing genetic variability. It's hard to do, but and you can't do it in people, obviously, but you can do it in rats. So the second step from there, once we've compared these, done this breeding process, we do what's called QTL analysis. And this looks at all the different spots on all the rats' chromosomes, and it finds out which genes specifically predict that they are going to be risky. And what we do is, you look, this, is, this is called a peak QTL. Every time we see a peak like this, that means that gene is always there when a rat is risky, and it's not there when a rat is safe. So we're able, that's how we're able to figure out, that's how we figure out a lot of things. That's how we figure out a lot of the genes involved with schizophrenia, with alcohol use, with novelty seeking, all kinds of things. And I'm interested in doing it with risk taking. Finally, last slide here. Once you've identified this gene, where do you go from there? What's the point, right? It's fun to do with 23andMe, but how can we use it? Well, right now we have technology. We have these special mutant rats and mice. They use what's called CRISPR technology. And without getting into detail, this allows you to delete or modify genes. So what we wanna do is take rats who are risky and delete or reduce expression of that gene and say, all right, does it take that rat and make them no longer risky? Can we change a rat's genetics and then by doing that, change its personality, if you will? Also, we wanna take a look at humans who are risky and say, all right, well, if we genotype you, do you have the same gene that rats do? And finally, from there, you can use things like 23andMe to, to be able to say, all right, you have this gene. And from based on all this preclinical study, we know this gene causes vulnerability to drug use. And we know this gene causes risk taking. And that is it. Props to my lab, Daniel Gabriel, Anna Lively. She's here, by the way. And Grace Minez, several undergrads too and collaborators. Um, thank you all for listening. It's always fun to give a talk in these days when we're so isolated. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. It was perfect, just what I wanted. Very uh, clear and uh, I think turned uh, people on to some very uh, interesting, cool techniques. Um, so uh, people who want to go for your morning break, certainly please do that. We'll come back at 10.35. If other people want to stay and ask some questions, um, we can have time for some questions. Did I have a question for Dr. Simon? Sure. This is Kabir. Um, um, great talk. Actually, I enjoyed it throughout. Um, a few things I, I want to just discuss with you. One, one, one issue is just the, the, the increase in dopamine and also the decrease in the level of uh, D2 receptors that you showed. I, I, I assume there is probably uh, an, an increase in dopamine because of 
uh, a decrease in the negative feedback mechanism, and that might be describing your data. Uh, regarding your your last uh, um, part of your presentation, which you you know talk about Fisher and Lewis rats, and then even you went from different suppliers of the same rat. Um, I remember I was doing my master's at St. John's University. We were uh, looking at uh, morphine tolerance and analgesia um, in Swiss rapster mice. We received mice from Charles River and also Takani. What we found was actually the sensitivity was way, way up in um, Swiss rapster mice from Takani. Um, and later on, we found out that the level of um, mu opioid receptor is significantly higher in those. So uh, before you do all these genetics, why don't you measure dopamine D2 levels in these rats, one thing. And then the other thing is because, you know, like these uh, environmental factors can, can because they're raised in different environments, that could be an impact of environmental factor rather than genetics. What do you think about that? Uh, that's a great point. And one thing we did to try to mitigate that concern is mm -hmm. instead of just ordering the rats and running them, we ordered them and then we bred another generation in-house. So just in case there was like a difference in their environment and the way they were raised, the way they were stored, um, all the rats that we used were born in the same environment and exposed to the same environment. So we tried to control for that factor. So that's, and that was actually a concern we had early on as we ran them. Initially, we ran rats directly from the, from the providers and there were different behavioral differences just because mm -hmm. I think the storage is so different. Really, it's kind of troubling. We have all these differences and similar strains of rats based on where they come from. But yeah, we tried our best to control the environments and mm -hmm. had them all born in house. I mean, I'm definitely very interested in looking at things like D2 receptors in these different strains. I would certainly think that it would be synced up with risk taking and that in the, uh, the group you saw that was riskier, you would potentially see less D2 receptors, much like we did previously, but there also might be differences. And another issue is this more, these more recent experiments where originally we didn't have female rats in these experiments. I didn't grad school and postdoc. Now we do. And we're actually seeing that males and females are different in terms of risk taking. So it's becoming even more complicated. And we're interested in, say, looking at sex hormones and things like that. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And we did what we could to mitigate those environmental factors. And we're definitely planning on looking at not just genetics, but the out outcome measures, things like dopamine, a receptor expression. Another thing we do in the lab is electrophysiology, which is recording activity in neurons. And I'm really interested in how neural activity during the task maps on to individual differences. Our rats who are really risky, do you, you see suppression in certain brain areas that you don't see in others? And that's what um, my grad students, Anna and Daniel, are both starting to do now is move on into uh, electrophysiology to understand individual differences. So does, that, so uh, does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Great question, thanks. So Nick, I, I, I really enjoyed your talk as well. Um, I, I had a couple of questions. Have you tried cross-fostering these two um, these two uh, strains uh, so that they you you control for how the um, sort of long-term sort of genetic well maybe epigenetic changes from how the mother treats the offspring we haven't yet that's a great point um if you notice the preliminary data the figure was like still straight out of spss which just shows how new these data are yep. <laughs> so we're uh, we are actually just kind of venturing into behavioral genetics. And we work with uh, Rob Williams and Hao Chen and Megan Moore. Yeah, I know Rob well. He's, he's, a good, he's a good guy. Indeed he is. He's been very generous to me and, yeah, uh, as a young PI in the city of Memphis. So yeah, I'm, there's a lot of questions to that. And that's another, that's a great point because we haven't been able to control for things like maternal uh, exposure and stuff like that. So that's another thing that I think we need to, at the very least, write into our next grants. I think that's a great, uh, that's a great point. So, 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 so talking about Rob, he has all these strains which have um, been quantified by um, in situ and uh, transcript levels. Have you, maybe you could do a correlation with his strains and 
impulsivity with regard to D2 receptor um, yeah. expression? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've am i talked to him about working with, they're called the BXD, and it's just yeah, all these yeah, different yeah. strains of, and just for everyone else, all these strains of mice that are really, really similar, but they're all kind of slightly different. And again, it's like twin studies. You're comparing these ultra similar rats and mice. Well, what do you, mice, so it's easier to identify genetic variants. Um, he has that readily available with mice. I think he's working on getting strains like that with rats. Oh yes, you've got rats, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, about and that. that's one of the issues is, <laughs> I think we could train this task in rat in mice, and some people have, but it's it difficult. Would be a, mice be a big behavior endeavor. is difficult. That's one of the problems with mice. The genetics much better, but the behavior is much less good. <laughs> yeah, well, we are working on uh, kind of making the task a little more abbreviated to for running in adolescence. So stuff like that might be kind of might open the door toward mouse studies just because you have yeah. the adolescence you have to be you can't shove them full of food the way you can with uh, adults and they just they tend to be a little more stressed out and things like that but nice. yeah i'm very interested in eventually getting my hands on those on his different strains and he says down eventually his plan is to get some rat strains that are near isogenic so hopefully down the line i could have those so that's yes i'm very interested in and i'd love to look at both dopamine markers and behavioral measures in those different strains. I know a lot of people are already looking at dopamine measures, like I Yench and all of Williams' crew. Yeah. But, <laughs> all right, thank you. Hello, I, I have a comment or question about, so you were trying to identify some genes in, 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 in different strain or risk, risk takers and other behavioral genes. So are you not taking any whole genome expression, I mean, sequencing approach to identify any variations? Yes, that? yeah, we're gonna, um, after we do the reduced complexity cross and use the, and uh, behaviorally characterize these animals, we're gonna genotype each one of them using like a whole genome approach. And uh, I think initially we're gonna look at the whole genome. Eventually the goal is to break it down to specific parts of the brain and to use different techniques, things like uh, RNA-seq to be able to figure out, okay, well, we know there are these gene expression differences and these gene variants, is it localized in the nucleus accumbens, the dorsal striatum? So we're gonna definitely start out with a whole genome approach and eventually we'd like to look into specific uh, uh, brain areas. So 